a remarkable piece of 3D filmmaking by a great filmmaker. And I think with, with filmmakers the ilk of people like uh, James Cameron and Tim Burton and uh, Robert Zemeckis and Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, they're all embracing 3D as a serious storytelling tool. These guys don't need a gimmick to sell a ticket. These guys are figuring out that they want to expand their storytelling arsenal, and, and they're taking it very seriously. So we are, too, at Sony. And I think it's an important thing uh, to take into consideration that there is a serious way to use 3D. And you may, if, for those of you who are stepping into it, you may have to go to the extremes of 3D to figure out where your comfort zone is. But um, when we're working with all the development folks at the studio now, people are very interested at a core level of understanding how 3D works. Uh, from a story development standpoint, all the way through to post-production, and that's what we're trying to focus on. Um, do you want me to get into the five yeah, minutes? Yeah, why don't you go ahead. Go do the five minutes. Um, uh, if you have your pencils sharpened, I, I'll be willing to take you through a whirlwind tour of what I call the five-minute 3D film school, if you want. Um, so I apologize for talking very quickly. You won't need your glasses for this, but uh, you may want to pay attention to the monitors. <coughs> so um, here is the 3D film school in five minutes. Okay, here we go. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to start by talking about the terminology we use in creating 3D. The first key uh, concept we're going to talk about is the understanding of how we see 3D. There's a very, imp uh, but it, there's some rules that you probably hear about. People always talk about rules, so I'm going to give you some rules. Uh, rule number one, making 3D is easy. Making good 3D is really hard. Rule two, create quality 3D and your audience will thank you. Rule three, do your homework, under understand 3D, and use it to enhance your stories in 3D. And rule four, probably most important, ignore all the other 3D rules that you hear, because none of it's really true. And what you really need to do is find your own comfort zone. Now, speaking of comfort zone, part of the reason why 3D is uncomfortable is this phenomenon referred to as vergence and accommodation. And what we mean by that is normally in the real world, if you, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length and you stare at your thumb and you move it towards your face, your eyes are doing two things. They're converging, they're actually rotating, and they're also adjusting their focus to keep your thumb in sharp focus. When we're creating that phenomenon in 3D, what ends up happening is uh, a situation in your brain is asked to separate two functions. We're bringing an object towards you, so your eyes are rotating inwards. But because we're projected on a flat screen surface at some point in the, in the distance, your eyes are having to maintain their focus at that distance, separate from where the object actually is. Uh, or appears to be. So that is where uh, you can experience extreme eye fatigue and, and uh, you may not know it instantly, but if you do a, a subtle bad 3D, it will add up to really bad 3D after a couple of hours. So this phenomena where your eyes are having to separate the notion of focus and, and uh, um, convergence is very important. And one way you can simulate it is if you bring your thumb really close to your, your face and you stare at it and then quickly switch focus to the background, you'll notice it takes a split second for your eyes to shift that focus. That's exactly what's happening when you're creating 3D images that come way out in space. Something to be very aware of. Um, the key terms you're going to hear about 3D have to do with uh, the spacing of the images. Now, in human beings, we refer to it as the interocular spacing. Uh, what determines our, uh, what we perceive as the scale of other things in our world is based on the distance between our eyes. And for most people, that's two and a half inches. So everything relative to that spacing uh, gives us a sense of scale. So elephants look big to us, but to an elephant, we look small because their eye spacing is much wider than ours. With camera systems, that's not a fixed distance. We have the ability to vary that distance, and that's what we refer to as interaxial, to, to uh, differentiate that from the fixed distance of our eyes. And by controlling the spacing of the cameras is how you create the depth in a scene, the, from the closest object to the farthest object. So that's kind of what you would consider your depth budget in a shot by the spacing between the cameras. Now, if you're using something that's narrower than our eyes as a, as a camera spacing, you end up with what's called hypo-stereo. Uh, where all the objects in the frame seem to be enlarged or gigantic. Um, if you go the opposite extreme where the cameras are farther apart than our eyes, then you end up with a, a situation called hyper stereo where everything is miniaturized, which is why shooting traditional sporting events from those camera positions way up in the stands make all the players look tiny because they're really far away and the only way to get 3D out of it is to really pull the cameras apart, which further miniaturizes. So something clearly to avoid. The second term you're going to learn a lot about is convergence. And this is uh, an area where uh, once you've established the depth of the scene with the interaxial spacing, convergence is going to determine where that volume is in relation to the screen surface of whatever the display system is you're looking at. So you've created your volume with interaxial spacing, and now you're sliding that into and out of the display surface using convergence. Um, in a situation, uh, in a, in anything you're shooting is going to require some convergence, because if you shot with parallel cameras, that would put anything at infinity at the plane of the screen you're looking at, and everything else would be in front of it, which is an extremely uncomfortable way to watch things. 
Uh, we do deliver IMAX films when we make them in that format, but only because the projectors are performing that convergence function. So convergence has to happen somewhere. But convergence also creates problems. As you can see, when you're rotating cameras, you're going to end up uh, very easily with vertical distortion in the edges, keystoning that happens opposite in each eye, where you then your eyes basically have to rectify uh, images in a way that our brains are not set up for. So convergence is a very important concept to understand how to work with. Um, very quickly, depth of field. Again, I mentioned earlier, uh, filmmakers have tended to use a lot of 2D techniques to direct the eye and the frame. Depth of field is not very successful in 3D. In a shot like this, you've got a, a scene where clearly the director wants you to see the, the, perf the character's face. But in three dimensions, you're going to be looking at that character's hand. It's the nature of human beings. You're going to look at whatever's closest to you. It can be argued that that's maybe a fight or flight uh, instinct. But regardless, you always look at whatever's closest to you first. And in, if you looked at this image in 3D and the hand was out of focus, it kind of pulls you out of the moment for a second because you're trying to resolve it, which is not a good thing for 3D. By sharpening that image up, as you see here, then suddenly that, is, that takes away that annoyance factor uh, that you would, where your brain is trying to figure that out. So that's why depth of field is a different issue. Cutting in depth is another extremely important concept, and this is where you're going to have to play as filmmakers in the editing room. As Phil said, look at 3D early, and as I would like to append to that, and often, um, because you really need to understand how 3D works in depth. If you look at this shot sequence really quickly, and you notice that we're cutting to and from various uh, uh, people in the conversation here, if, those, if you don't know where those people are in depth, and you're cutting this, and they're, and they're jumping back and forth in depth, it's a very uncomfortable thing to watch, because there's no such thing as a cut in real life. The closest thing we have to it is a blink, and things don't change that rapidly in a blink. So you really have to understand the sequence of shots and, and how they're, they're going to be juxtaposed so that you can then make your depth decisions. And all of this is really based on how the shots are converged back when you shot them. So again, something to think about. Um, quickly, just an, another set of terms that you probably need to understand is the notion of uh, parallax. Uh, negative parallax is basically anything that appears in the audience space or out in front of the screen, and positive parallax is anything that happens inside the screen. You'll hear those terms a lot. They probably won't mean much to you now, but they will. Um, finally, there's, a, there's an issue of this uh, phenomenon called divergence. It only occurs in artificially created 3D images, which is a phenomenon where normally, if you're looking in the distance at infinity, your eyes are parallel. Okay, and uh, if you bring an object closer to you, your eyes converge, as I mentioned before, and they rotate inward towards that object. It's possible in 3D, to, through no fault of a number of processes, where you actually create a situation where your eyes would have to rotate outward in order to fuse those images properly in 3D. Um, there's a very, very basic uh, set of rules that would prevent that from happening, but the problem as filmmakers, and there are a few commercial releases out there of some uh, low-budget horror films that um, seem to have ignored this advice, um, and they only viewed what they were shooting on a monitor. And the problem is you may be shooting something with divergence and you can't see it yet because it's going to end up on a 40-foot screen. And the scale is going to basically cause divergence to happen, something that is impossible to fix without uh, throwing away one eye and fixing it. So you don't want to create a situation of divergence. So very quickly, the essentials of creating good 3D. Understand the terminology. Experiment with creating 3D however you can, even in a virtual sense. And there are some tools that will let you do that. Uh, experiment with editing in 3D. There are also some tools that will let you do that. Most importantly, getting back to film school, plan your shoot and then shoot your plan for 3D because you don't want anything to go wrong with 3D that would slow down an already expensive uh, and constricted production. Please don't make bad 3D unless that's your intention. <laughs> um, avoid divergence and extreme parallax. We didn't talk about edge violations, but that's another thing that is a pitfall in 3D that's easily avoided if you know what to look for. Work with experienced stereographers and use 3D to enhance your storytelling. That's extremely important. Uh, don't just use it as a gimmick. Uh, here's some tools that I mentioned. Frameforge 3D is a great previs tool that has all of the stereo camera controls you would ever need to be able to understand these concepts of convergence and uh, interaxial spacing and divergence and all of that stuff. And you can see it in stereo on a variety of monitors you could buy now. Uh, Cineform is a plugin for Final Cut that lets you see full resolution uh, 3D while you're rear cutting, so which is great. Uh, solution Avid also has a 3D solution. Adobe After Effects has some 3D uh, uh, functions built in as do Sony Vegas Video, Autodesk Maya, Maxon, Maxon Cinema 4D. But the most important tool in your arsenal is your brain. 
Um, so please use it <laughs> and when you're trying to do 3D. There are some camera systems. As, uh, these are probably the top three. Um, and uh, there will be more coming. So uh, you'll, you know, all of these folks have considered independent productions. And if the production is right, they'll usually cut you a deal. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few places to go right now for rigs. I don't really recommend you building your own just yet <laughs> until you've gotten a little experience on it. But these are some companies that you can go to. So anyway, sorry, that was six minutes.